Uh, I thought it would be good to start with a general overview of scattering because my understanding is that the students, they don't have that much experience. So mm -hmm. even if some other uh, teachers have already, you know, talked about the basics, I think it's good to remind them. And then uh, I will talk mostly, I will give some examples of uh, carbohydrate gels. So. I don't yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no yeah. Okay. So I think if if um, Anne is going to listen a few minutes, we'd rather get started now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Marta Martinez Sanz that I met the first time, I think, in, in Sydney. Yes. In the new <laughs> uh, right. organized by the Elliot Gilbert. So mm -hmm. So Marta comes from Spain, but is almost half Australian, I think, because you spend a lot of time in, in Australia yes. doing a lot of nice uh, work on um, carbohydrates or using uh, neutron scattering and other techniques as well. So uh, without further ado, please go ahead, Marta. Thank you, Tommy. So it is my pleasure to, to be here in this course participating. Uh, I want to congratulate of the students uh, who have been chosen because I think this is a great opportunity to learn about scattering techniques. Not so many scientists uh, can say they are expert on these techniques. So uh, you are very lucky to be here and please take the opportunity to uh, ask many, as many questions as you need. Uh, if you want to come write in the chat or if you want you can wait until we finish and then we will have discussions. So I will, I will tell you a little bit about how we can apply scattering techniques to uh, the investigation of the structure of carbohydrates. And as I was explaining, I would like to start with a brief introduction of the basics of scattering techniques. Um, I think most of you uh, haven't got so much experience, so I think it's good to, you know, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what are the basics of these techniques. Then I will go on talking about uh, what types of structures uh, we can find in most of the carbohydrates. Uh, and then the application of scattering techniques in the particular case of carbohydrates. And finally, I have several practical examples, but I don't know if we will have time to, to talk about all of them. Uh, but I think it's, it's best if we leave some time for questions. So we will see as we go. So first of all, uh, as you know, scattering techniques are based on the interaction between a source of radiation, which can be light, x-rays or neutrons and the particles in our sample. So what we do in scattering techniques is that we analyze the scattered radiation uh, and so that it can give us information on particle size, shape, orientation, interactions between particles, etc. So uh, here you can see a very basic scheme of what scattering techniques uh, are. And as you may have heard along these uh, past days, uh, the scattering angle is related to the scattering vector, which we, um, we typically use in, in scattering experiments. And at the same time, this uh, parameter is related to real space dimensions. So what this means uh, is that depending on the type of structure or their size range that we want to study in our sample, uh, we can also find different scattering techniques. So for instance, uh, if we have our detector position uh, closer to the sample, we will be able to register uh, higher angles. And that means we are working with wide angle scattering techniques. And these techniques uh, are going to reveal structures ranging from 0.1 to one nanometer. That means, for instance, in the case of carbohydrates, we can study uh, crystalline structures. Then if we move the detector farther away from the sample, we will be able to register lower angles. So we are talking about small angle scattering techniques. And in that case, uh, we can study uh, size ranges from one to several hundreds of, of nanometers. So again, in the case of carbohydrates, uh, we 
that means that we will be able to study uh, the structure of polymeric chains. So the size, conformation, interactions. And finally, we have also ultra small uh, angle scattering techniques. They are based on a different um, arrangement uh, in terms of instruments. But uh, we can also study uh, size ranges from several hundreds of nanometers up to 10 microns. And that's a real advantage uh, in the case of carbohydrates because sometimes we have um, larger structures. For instance, in the case of gels, uh, if we want to study the mesh size of uh, some polysaccharides, we will need to use ultra small angle scattering techniques. And then, as you also know, uh, we have two main sources of radiations, which are X-rays and neutrons. And this is very important. Uh, I'm talking all the time about uh, carbohydrates, but this is also this can also be applied to other types of uh, of materials. But in the case of carbohydrates, this is especially important because X-rays um, are going to be able to highlight differences in crystalline and amorphous domains because they are sensitive to variations in electron density. So for instance, you will see later on that in the case of cellulose, X-rays are going to gener generate contrast between crystalline cellulose and amorphous cellulose. While on the case of neutrons, since they are scattered by the at atomic nuclei in the, in the uh, atoms, uh, they depend on the nuclear structure. So that means uh, we can play around uh, by substituting uh, hydrogen atoms in our sample with deuterium, and in that way we can generate contrast. So that's a very powerful tool. We will also see later on contrast uh, variation. Uh, and in the case of carbohydrates, since we have many labile hydro hydroxyl groups, this is an advantage. So we need to uh, know that the source of radiation that we are selecting for our experiments is very important and we have to select it on the basis of the sample composition and the structural features that we want to investigate. And in this uh, context, the scattering length density uh, is a very important parameter. We will talk uh, a lot about that because that's something you need to take into account before you plan your experiments and also after you analyze your data uh, to, to know what is the contrast that's being generated between the components in your sample and the solvents that you are using. So here you can see graphically an example of how uh, using neutrons or x-rays will highlight different components in our sample. In the case of neutrons, we can see the hydrogen from the plastic components in a camera, while in the case of X-rays, we will see more clearly or uh, we will have more contrast uh, in, the in the metallic components. And why are the scattering techniques so important uh, for us that we want to, to investigate the structure of materials or biological samples? Well, you know that uh, microscopy are, techniques are typically used to investigate the structure of, uh, of many types of materials. I, I, I know in biology, uh, because uh, I think many of you have experience or background in biology, uh, microscopy techniques are uh, widely used, um, but they have several issues. First of all, we are limited to a very small region of the sample, so we never know if that's representative of the whole sample. And then secondly, uh, in most of the times we need to make a, a sample preparation, meaning that we probably will have to dry the sample and this is a, a big problem, especially when working with carbohydrates, as we will see later on. And on the other hand, we have scattering techniques, uh, which evaluate the change in the direction of a source of radiation as it interacts with the material that we are analyzing. So we will get a volume average of the sample that we are analyzing. That means we can have a more representative uh, results from the structure in our sample. 
the complex part is how to analyze the data. But if we are able to, you know, to, to analyze our data properly, we can extract a lot of uh, uh, structural information, which is going to be representative. So very briefly, uh, the advantages of the scattering techniques is that they are non-destructive. As I said, they, they give us an idea of the bulk properties. We need minimal sample preparation. And then in the case of carbohydrates, we also have the possibility or the advantage. Well, not in the case of carbohydrates, but it means that in the case of carbohydrates, it's a great advantage that we can use the contrast uh, variation technique or selective deterioration of the samples. And then disadvantages mainly is that many people don't, do not know how to uh, interpret the scattering data so that uh, we need to understand very well what we are doing plan our experiments very well and then be able to extract as much information as possible. And then I would also like to highlight that it's always advisable to combine scattering methods with other techniques so that we can know, uh, for instance, when we are doing our uh, data fitting, we need to know if the results that we are obtaining are representative or of our sample so that it is always advisable to complement with other methods. It could be X-ray diffraction, microscopy, spectroscopy, whatever you need uh, to gather some information on the structure of your samples. So let's start with carbohydrates. Um, I don't know if any of you is particularly working with carbohydrates in their projects. Uh, but I will start with the basics. Uh, so carbohydrates are biomolecules, bio which consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And um, as you probably know, we have the basic unit, which are the sugars, monosaccharides. And then we have also that these saccharides, which are the combination of two monosaccharides. And then uh, these monosaccharides could also combine to form very large chains, which are the polysaccharides. So these are the, the complex chains that we know as polysaccharides. Some examples that I'm sure you have heard of is cellulose. And then uh, you also have there the structure of amylose, which is one of the two components of starch. And why are carbohydrates so important? Uh, well, we can find them as uh, major components in fruits and vegetables, where they account for more than 90% of the dry content. And also in the food industry, they are very, very important uh, because uh, they are used as additives um, due to their several functionalities. They, they can be used as sickeners, gelling agents, also to encapsulate uh, bioactive components or even additives for low calorie products. And those carbohydrates can have different uh, origins. We can find them in plants uh, and some examples uh, would be cellulose, hemicellulose, starches, pectins. We can also find carbohydrates in seaweeds and these carbohydrates are nowadays very important for the industry because uh, mainly for food industry they are being used there is a lot of interest uh, in them because they have gelling properties which are very good for some food products so in that case uh, you probably have heard of agar but we have also alginates carbaginans fucoidans etc and finally, uh, carbohydrates can also be produced by several microorganisms. And some examples would be shantans. I'm sure probably you have heard of shantan gum because it's also used in the food industry. Pululan, gelan, cardlan, several types of gums. And here I would also like to mention uh, bacterial cellulose because it's possible for some microorganisms also to synthesize cellulose. So most of, the, of these carbohydrates, we find them in nature as hydrated systems. They are always or almost always associated with water. So 
as we were talking previously, uh, drying the samples for any type of analysis is going to be problematic because we are not going to get information on the native structure of the, of the carbohydrate. So that's something that you always need to keep in mind. And then the, the other thing is that while some of the carbohydrates might present crystalline structure, so they are impermeable or insoluble in water, and that might be the case of cellulose, some other carbohydrates have an amorphous structure and therefore they are soluble in water. And that may be the case, for instance, of uh, phycocolloids. So agars, alginates, they are soluble in water. We can disperse them and then they form gels when they are subjected to uh, specific temperature conditions. So uh, that's one particularity of some carbohydrates that they can form uh, hydrogel structures and that's uh, one of the examples that we will see uh, at the end because they are very interesting uh, for several uh, industries and here i'm showing you the the some examples of the hierarchical structure of uh, two major polysaccharides the first one is starch so that you have an idea of how complex the structure of uh, one carbohydrate can be. Um, as you see here in, in this scheme, uh, we can go from the atomic level on how the starch uh, polysaccharide chains are arranged, forming crystalline structures. And for that, we can use uh, wide angle scattering techniques. We can also use X-ray uh, diffraction. And then these uh, crystalline structures are arranged in a very specific way, which is known as lamella. So they are ordered, forming these structures, which, which are typically around nine nanometers. And they are organized in such a way that, that they are combined also with amorphous domains. So um, this size range is, uh, can be typically covered using um, small angle scattering techniques, such as SACS. And then we would move to the next structural level in which these lamellae are uh, combined with the amorphous domains, forming the growth rings in starch. And this structural level, if we want to study, we would have to go to ultra small angle scattering techniques, but we can also, of course, combine them with microscopy and spectroscopy methods. And then uh, we also have uh, major polysaccharides such as cellulose, uh, which you can find in many vegetal products, in grains, uh, in fruits. Depending on the source, cellulose will have a different structure and it will also be combined with other components so that the presence of these components will at the same time affect the structure of cellulose. But here uh, we have the basic structure and again we can cover different size ranges and we need to keep in mind when we are doing scattering experiments that we are covering a specific size range but uh, we have to take into account that uh, the, the other structural levels are also having an effect. So in the case of cellulose, we also have uh, the crystalline arrangement of the cellulose molecules to form the crystallites. This is uh, typically studied by wax or X-ray diffraction. And then these crystallites are uh, arranged uh, forming uh, what is known as cellulose microfibrils. And these microfibrils have a very specific structure. Depending on the source, they can have a different cross-section, which is more um, similar to a parallel pipette, or it can be modeled, as you will see, as cylinders. And the dimensions are, are different depending on the source. And then these microfibrils are interacting with each other, with water and with other components to form the bundles, uh, the, the cellulose bundles. And this is going to be completely different depending on the source that we, that we are um, analyzing. 
And finally, in the case of plants, we have the primary cell walls and secondary cell walls, which are the structures in which cellulose is combined with, with other polysaccharides, proteins, uh, polyphenols, etc. So um, another important aspect is to take into account that the carbohydrates can, can form different types of structures. Here I'm showing only some examples so that you have an idea. As I was telling you before, uh, some carbohydrates can form hydrogels. And these hydrogels are formed uh, when we, we, we need to have first a solution in which the carbohydrate chains are randomly distributed. So they are typically salt in water. And then uh, if we hit uh, these solutions, uh, it happens sometimes that these carbohydrate chains, they can arrange forming uh, double helices structures. And uh, this is the first step in the gelation process. So that we have this um, ordered structure of double helices. And these double helices, if we keep, uh, if we then uh, cool the sample, they can uh, interact with each other to form this type of bundles in which they are interacting with each other, typically by hydrogen bonding. And they form a very, well, a more or less strong structure depending on, on the polysaccharide um, so that it has physical integrity. So uh, something like gelatins, for instance, uh, I think. So that's one type of uh, structure that we can find in, in carbohydrates, but we have also some 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 other things that we can that we can find for instance um, if we are working with uh, polysaccharides and proteins so the mixtures of both uh, they can form interpenetrating networks and this could be of a physical nature or a more chemical interactions but the the idea is that uh, we have some kind of interwinning of the um, chains of our polysaccharide and the other molecule. It could be polysaccharides with different um, uh, surface char charts, or it could be that we are working with one polysaccharide, uh, for instance, anionic polysaccharide, and then a protein with positive charges so that they, they can interact uh, with each other. And finally, uh, I would also like to mention that we can also find polysaccharides in emulsions. Um, so although typically if to stabilize oil droplets, uh, we find proteins. Um, we have been working lately on, on the development of uh, emulsions, which can be stabilized by either the combination of proteins and polysaccharides or just polysaccharides, which are able to gel and then form domains uh, at the surface of the oil droplets. So this was just to give you some examples of the structures that you can find. But in all these cases, you will see that scattering methods are very, very powerful to give us an understanding of, of the structure that we, that we have. So um, as I was uh, telling you before, in all the types of uh, materials where we find carbo carbohydrates, it could be food, could be biological systems, solutions, emulsions for food industry. We will also have water. And water is going to be intimately interacting with the carbohydrates. And that's something we need to keep on mind always for preparing of, of our experiments. Because drying affects strongly the native structure of carbohydrates. And this is something we know for sure, uh, for instance, in the case of cellulose, we know that once it has been dried, we cannot go back to the initial state because the, the, the hydrogen bonding that is generated when drying cannot be disrupted uh, if we want to rehydrate uh, the material. So that's something very important. And in that sense, scattering techniques are very powerful because we can study the structure of carbohydrates in their native state. We don't need to dry the samples, as you will see. <clears throat> 
So what are the phases uh, when we are planning or we know that we are going to perform scattering experiments? First of all, I would, I would advise that you uh, carry out some preliminary characterization but by using other methods. We need to have some idea of the structure of our samples. Um, and in the case of carbohydrates, it would be very good if we have some characterization by microscopy. I know I said that microscopy is not the best method to study the structure, but it can be helpful to complement our scattering experiments. You will see later on with the example of cellulose. Um, it is also very important to know uh, what is the chemical structure uh, of our sample and for that we can typically use FTIR or NMR in the case of carbohydrates and it would also be good to have some idea of the particle size uh, because that, that is also going to determine what type of technique uh, we want to use uh, for our experiments. And so once we have some information of our sample, let's say that we start our scattering experiments. So important things that we need to take uh, into account is that sample preparation is going to be very important for uh, a successful experiment. Uh, in the case of carbohydrates, it is uh, critical to avoid sample drying. I know I, I have said it several times, but uh, I don't want you to forget about that because it's very important. And so um, we need to use suitable uh, sealed sample holders. Uh, here you have a, an image showing some of the sample holders that, uh, that could be typically used for a SANS experiment. So you see in these cells, uh, the first one starting from the, from the left, that would be good uh, when we have a more liquid-like samples. And then uh, the second one, uh, we used uh, a lot this type of cell for, for gels. Um, you will see uh, later on that uh, in some cases, it's uh, good to, to soak the, the gels in different uh, mixtures of water and D2O. So in this case, it is possible to, to fill the, the cell with the hydrogel, with a small piece of the hydrogel, and then add the solvent uh, so that it's soaked in, in this solvent. Um, we also need to determine the range of concentrations, uh, which is going to, to be good for our experiments. Uh, we, we want to avoid ha having a lot of noise in, in our signal, but we don't want to saturate uh, the signal either. So if you haven't done experiments before with your material, I would advise that, first of all, you do some a set of experiments just checking on the on the concentrations and then we need to set up the experiment all the parameters in our experiment according to the expected size ranges so uh, if we are doing sacs or sans we can modify uh, the the q range uh, within the 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 possibilities of the of the instrument um, but we can modify it so that we make sure that we are going to cover the size range that we are interested in. And finally, um, and especially critical for SANS, uh, so when we are using neutrons, it is um, very important to select suitable solvents, which are going to give us enough contrast. Uh, and how, how do we do that? So, um, in this case, it is very important to know the scattering intensity of our material because that's going to, to make us choose a suitable solvent to generate contrast between the sample and the solvent. And the scattering intensity, um, I, I'm sure you, you have had some other lectures giving you some, some of the basics, but um, just very briefly, it is related to several uh, parameters. So the number of particles, the volume of the particles, the scattering length density, and then the form factor and the structure factor, which are related to the particles shape and size and the correlations. But as you can see, the scattering length density 
is one of the parameters that is going to affect the scattering intensity. So we need to take it into account. And so in scattering experiments, we need to have enough, enough contrast between the sample and the solvent to see the components in our sample. And uh, the contrast uh, is going to be generated taking into account the scattering length density of the sample and the scattering length density of the solvent that we are using. So in that image, you can see an example in which uh, we have um, the same uh, refraction index of the solvent and, and the beds. And another um, example in which they are not the same so that we can generate contrast. It's something like that. This is a visual example of what we can do when using um, different combinations of solvents, especially in, in the case of neutrons. So the scattering length density, uh, this is the formula. And as you will see, it's not very, it's not very complicated. Uh, you also have online calculators. I will show you later on to, to estimate the scattering length density of uh, the main component. In, in your sample. So things that we need to know, the scattering length, you can find in tables uh, from all the atoms uh, forming your, ma your material. Uh, we need to know the physical density of uh, the material and that may be a little bit more complex in some times. Uh, you can find, typically you, you need to find for, for literature uh, to find a, a value for this. Um, and then the molecular weight. That's very important also, we, we need to know. So with those uh, values, we can calculate the scattering length density of our uh, material. And here is an example uh, where uh, you have the calculations for the scattering length density of water and D2O. Um, both for X-rays and for neutrons, because you know the scattering length is not going to be the same uh, depending on the on the source of radiation. So I'm not going into detail uh, with this. You can check on uh, on the presentation later on. But uh, just important to highlight that uh, while in the case of X-rays, you see that the scattering length density of water and D2 is the same. So that means we cannot play around with contrast. In the case of neutrons, the scattering length density of water and D2O is completely different. So that gives us the advantage of selecting what type of solvent we can use depending on the scattering length density of our sample. The objective may be to generate the maximum contrast uh, possible or we can also look for something that is giving us almost zero contrast because we want to highlight the structure of other component in the sample, for instance. So here is an example of a, an online calculator that, that I use a lot uh, to calculate the scattering length density. Um, here is the, the example for cellulose. And you can see we only need to, to put the molecular formula of, of the material, the density, and then we can calculate the neutron and the X-ray uh, scattering length density. So this is very good. And here is an example of how we can manipulate the scattering length density um, contrast in our samples. This is an example for, for cellulose but it can be applied to any other carbohydrate. So as you can see, using the online calculator and just knowing the molecular formula and the physical density, we know that the neutron scattering length density for cellulose is 1.87, whereas for X-rays, it's higher, it's around 14. And then uh, on the right side, you have the scattering length densities for water and for D2O. As you see, if we are going to do an X-ray experiment, it doesn't really matter if we use water or D2O. Uh, so typically, we, we perform the experiments in, in water because that's the solvent we typically find in, in nature. So 
that's fine. And then if we are going to do a neutron experiment, uh, you can see if we look at the scattering length densities uh, of the cellulose, water and D2O, you can see that we will have higher contrast if we uh, use D2O as our solvent. Um, but as I said, it, it, we, we may not want to generate a maximum contrast because imagine that we have several components in our sample and we want to make cellulose invisible. In that case, we can calculate uh, what would be the mixture of water and D2O that would make cellulose invisible. And that's the, that is known as a contrast match point, uh, meaning that we will have zero contrast. A cellulose would be invisible. In this case, it would be 35% D2O, but uh, we have to calculate this for each carbohydrate. And then uh, another advantage of neutrons is that we can uh, play around by substituting some of the hydrogen atoms with deuterium. And that uh, is known as selective deuteration. We can re replace all the hydrogen atoms uh, in our carbohydrate, and that, that's typically done by chemical approaches, but we can also uh, substitute some of the hydrogen atoms, so have a certain degree of substitution. Um, in the case of uh, cellulose, uh, here I'm showing you how the scattering length density would change if we would have a fully deuterated uh, cellulose. As you see, the molecular formula obviously is different because all the hydrogen atoms have been replaced with deuterium. And then the scattering length density in the case of x-rays would be almost the same. So that's why uh, this approach is not useful for x-rays. But in the case of neutrons, as you see, we have increased a lot the, the scattering length density of the cellulose. In this case, uh, we would have more or higher contrast between the deuterated cellulose and water rather than uh, D2O. So, this may be helpful also when we want to highlight the structure of other components and we, we, we want to play around with the contrast between the cellulose and the, the solvent. So um, how can we estimate the contrast match point uh, for our carbohydrate or our sample in general? We know that the contrast match point is uh, the point at which the scattering length density of the sample equals that of the solvent. So in samples with labile uh, hydroxyl groups, such as the case of carbohydrates, uh, we have to keep in mind that the scattering length density values will change depending on the ratio of D2O that we are using in our solvent. Why? Because imagine that we take a piece of a cellulose hydrogel and we soak it in a mixture of 30% D2O and water. Um, as soon as the hydroxyl groups from cellulose uh, uh, find the D2O, some of these uh, hydrogen atoms are going to be exchanged with deuterium. So the sample is changing. And therefore, uh, we can only have an estimation of the contrast match point because, as you will see later on, uh, the, the, the theoretical curve that we should have when representing our data is going to be affected by this exchange. So that's something very important. So to calculate the, the contrast match points from a sample experimentally, what we can do is we can take our sample and uh, measure it uh, by sums using different mixtures of water and D2O. And then once we have uh, our data, we can go and measure the intensity as at a certain uh, Q uh, point we need to find a Q point which is not being affected by any structural features. So uh, typically we can go, well, not typically. In the case of cellulose, I know we can move in the um, low Q range, but you will have to see for your sample, for your particular sample. 
And then we can plot the, the square root of the intensity versus the um, percentage of D2O in the solvent so that we will have a straight line or we should have a straight line like this. And the point at which the square root of the intensity equals zero uh, is the contrast match point. Um, another possibility, uh, as we will see later on with cellulose, is to plot what and more advisable, I would say, when we know that we have a substitution of some of the hydroxyl groups, is to represent the, in, the intensity term uh, versus the, the amount of detron in our sample. And we should have a parabolic function in that case with a minimum point. Uh, and that minimum point would be the contrast match uh, point. But we, we will see. So then after we have done our experiment, the, the next uh, step would be data processing. Um, we, we will talk a little bit uh, about that as well, and modelization. So this is the difficult part, I would say, because we have our scattering data. This is our uh, one example of the scattering pattern from, from cellulose. And now what do we do with that? So uh, here comes the problem many times. We don't know what to do with this. So the objective is to find a mathematical function which is able to describe our experimental data. Um, we can perform a very basic analysis of the data just to you know, determine the slope in the, in the low Q range, um, and to compare between our samples, that's going to give us an idea if we have more branch structures or not. But we can go more in depth in the analysis. And in that case, uh, we need to find a fitting function. Um, this fitting function, um, I don't know what software you, you will be using, but uh, in many cases, what you have is like a library of functions. And you need to find one which is um, suitable for your sample uh, according to what you already know of your sample. I mean, for instance, in, in the case of cellulose, we know that we have microfibrils. At these microfibrils, we could modelize them as uh, cylindrical objects. So then maybe we can start doing some trials with a function um, for cylinders that would, would be a very good start point. So we need to have some idea of what we are looking for. And we need to fix or constrain as many parameters in this fitting function as possible based on the knowledge of our sample. In the same example, I would say, if we have an idea of what are the dimensions of the cellulose microfibrils, maybe we can constrain the cylinder radius because we have an idea of, of the range that, that it should be. So um, as we were uh, talking before, the scattering intensity is related um, to several factors. One of them is the form factor, which is related to the shape of the particles in our sample. And therefore, we have several fitting functions which are based on these uh, particle shapes. So for instance, we have Gaussian coils, uh, that would be the case of amorphous polysaccharide solutions. Uh, we have spheres, rods, and disks. The rods would be a very good start point uh, in the case of fibrils, or uh, if we have, uh, for instance, jelly, jelly polysaccharides, which form uh, double helices. So, but, uh, for each type of sample, we will have to go and try with uh, different uh, possibilities and see which, wor which one works better. And then the other parameter uh, important for the, for the scattering intensity is the structure factor, which is related to interactions between our particles. And that's going to affect how the scattering patterns look. So maybe we, we can have a peak, uh, which is related to uh, interactions taking place in our sample. 
Um, and it is especially important uh, for um, particles which are ele electrostatically charged. So, for instance, if we are working with protein polysaccharide uh, coacervates, that term may be important. So, we also need to consider this uh, when looking for our function. And finally, as we were seeing previously for starch and cellulose, we also have to keep in mind that most carbohydrates have a hierarchical structure. That means that even though we are studying a certain size range, it may be possible that we are uh, losing some information um, in the higher size range or in the smaller size range. And this may also affect our scattering patterns. So, uh, for instance, in the case of cellulose, it may be that we have very large uh, fibrils with very large uh, dimensions on the lo longitudinal axis. We are missing this information on the on a SAMS or SACS experiment, but the scattering intensity in the low Q range is going to be affected by these structural features, which we are not seeing in our experiment. So that's also something you, you always have to keep in mind. And with, with all of this, uh, maybe we can go into some examples. So um, you see how all of this is applied in the reality when we are uh, working with different types of carbohydrates. Um, in the presentation, I prepared three different examples, uh, but I think maybe we will have time for, for one or probably two, I don't know. But the important thing is that uh, you really understand uh, what we are doing, why we are doing um, these experiments, and that you ask uh, many questions at the end. So uh, the first example is cellulose. Uh, the second example is some experiments uh, performed on starch and microalgae plants. And the third example uh, is related to sulfated polysaccharide hydrogels, uh, such as agar, but um, we, we will start with cellulose. So um, why cellulose is so important? It's uh, the main structural component in, in plant cell walls where it, it is combined with other components such as semicellulosis, pectins, lignin, proteins. Well, depending on, on what kind of tissue, we will have other components. Uh, but cellulose is uh, the main structural component. And it would provide uh, different functionalities depending on if we are um, talking about primary cell walls, which are the growing tissues or secondary cell walls, which we can find, for instance, in, in wood. So going back again to how cellulose is organized hierarchically, we have the cellulose crystallites, which can, at the same time, uh, present different crystalline allomorphs. So that's something that will also depend on the source that we are working with. Uh, we know, for instance, that um, uh, beta cell, uh, the one beta allomorph is uh, more abundant in some vegetal tissues, while the one alpha allomorph is more abundant in seaweeds or bacterial cellulose. And then these uh, crystallites are arranged into microfibrils with different cross sections and uh, dimensions, depending on the source. And finally, we have the ribbons. So if we have several size ranges that we want to study, we will have to combine different characterization techniques. And what is the approach to study the structure of cellulose? Well, um, since we find cellulose in plants combined with other components, if we want to isolate the structure of cellulose, we will have uh, to remove the other components. So what could be do in sometimes is to uh, perform several extraction uh, steps so as to isolate the cellulose uh, from, uh, from the plant cell walls. But uh, we can also um, use an interesting approach, uh, which is the, the use of a model system, in this case, bacterial cellulose. 
And why uh, is it interesting? Because in that case, um, the bacteria uh, synthesize only cellulose. We feed the bacteria with sugars and they are able to synthesize cellulose in the form of a hydrogel. But we can also incorporate other components into the culture media so that the bacteria uh, will be able to produce cellulose in the presence of that component. And uh, we will be mimicking somehow the, the synthesis process that is taking place in the plants and also be able to isolate the effect of that particular component, that hemicellulose, on the structure of cellulose. So I'm telling you all of this because I will start with some results from, from uh, bacterial cellulose hydrogels, which are the more the, the, the simplest model that, that we can use because it's only cellulose and water. And going back to the to the scattering lens densities, uh, because that's something very important when we are planning our experiments, you see that we will find contrast between uh, crystalline cellulose and amorphous cellulose when using X-rays. While in the case of using neutrons, we can generate contrast between the uh, cellulose and um, the different uh, degrees of exchange uh, using DTRO to soak our pellicles or by producing fully deuterated cellulose. So um, in this case, you will see that the approach that we followed in these experiments uh, was uh, to soak the, the hydrogels in different mixtures of DTRO and water so that we will have uh, different degrees of exchange. But we also tested the possibility of producing partially deuterated cellulose by feeding the bacteria with a deuterated um, glucose. So here is the experiment setup. Uh, you see that it's very simple. Uh, the, the, the idea is very simple. We take the cellulose hydrogel a small piece of the of the hydrogel and we soak it in different mixtures of water and d2o in uh, we were using the cells that i was showing you previously and we perform sans uh, a contra, uh, sans experiments so you see here uh, the sans patterns for our samples in the different uh, d2o h2o mixtures and so now what do we do with, with these results? Well, um, we wanted to extract as much information as possible. So uh, we started by trying to find a theoretical model to, to, find, to fit our data. So at this point, we need to think about what do we know about our system? In the case of cellulose, we have uh, we know uh, from literature that the ribbons are assumed to have a, a flat ribbon morphology with a cross section of seven nanometers by twenty to sixty nanometers, and so these are the possibilities that we have. We may use a parallel pipette, a large disk uh, model, and in fact. Uh, at the time that we performed the experiments, there was one paper uh, using a large disk model to feed the data from cellulose, but um, this model uh, needed to use a polydispersity of 95% to get reasonable fits. So you have to be very critical uh, with what you are doing. And if you see that you need a, such a high polydispersity index, that probably means that the model is not suitable for your samples because, and that's something that, that I want you also to, to keep in mind. Many models could work for your sample um, if you adjust the parameters. So you see, if you put 95% polydispersity, maybe a model can, can work to feed your data. But then you have to be critical and think if that uh, makes sense, uh, that it makes physical sense. And also, um, based on the knowledge that you have for your sample, uh, the parameters that you are getting from the feed, you have to assess if they also make sense. 
So in this case, uh, we want we tested a different model based on the cylindrical morphology. As you can see uh, in this uh, plot, none of the models that we proposed was suitable to fit our experimental data. And so we thought that maybe uh, we, we were doing something wrong uh, and we were forgetting about something in, in our sample. And we thought that uh, since we know that the structure of cellulose ribbons is actually formed by um, smaller uh, components, which are the cellulose microfibrils, and that we have a lot of water in our system, it may be possible that the cellulose microfibrils are not solid objects, but that we have a solid component and then a water a layer hydrating the, the microfibrils. So um, we tried to find the model to account for this hydration layer which at the same time could be changing when we are soaking our samples in different uh, solvents. So we could have regions with different scattering and density values. And therefore we proposed uh, to use a model, um, a core shell uh, cylinder model in which the scattering and density of the inner region is not the same as the scattering and density in the outer region, because in the outer region, we have more labile hydroxyl groups with can, which can be easily exchanged when we are soaking our samples. So um, this model had a lot of parameters, um, as you can see there, but uh, since we already had some knowledge on the sample, we were able to fix or constrain some of them. The ones uh, which are uh, in bold, they, they were uh, fixed and uh, some of them were also constrained between values that we thought made physical sense. So that in the end, we didn't have a model with 19 parameters that we don't know the range and we don't know the values that they should have. That, that would be you probably won't get uh, good results uh, if you try to feed your data without constraining any of the parameters. So, as you can see, this model worked much better uh, to feed the data from, from cellulose. Um, you can also use Kratky plots. Uh, sometimes, you know, the structural features are not very evident uh, in the scattering data. In that case, you can always plot the, the, the Kratky plots where you, you would see, for instance, if you have shoulder features, they, they will appear um, more evident uh, so that you can check on the suitability of your, or of your fitting. And then the next point would be uh, using the contrast variation experiments to do a sim simultane simultaneous fitting of all the data. If you test a model, it works well for one sample, then the next step would be to use this model to fit all the data from a contrast variation um, experiments. And if it works, that's a very good sign. That, that means you, you found a very good model for, for your sample. So in this case, as you can see, the model worked very well to fit uh, simultaneously the data from cellulose in five different uh, solvent conditions. And from the parameters that we obtained, we were able to extract uh, structure information on the, how the core of the cellulose ribbons is arranged. Um, the amount of solvent that we that we have interacting with cellulose, the dimensions, and the same for the for the shell region. And as I said, uh, what another interesting approach would be to generate a higher contrast by um, replacing some of the hydrogen atoms in the cellulose with deuterium. In this in this case, we have the advantage that 
since we were using the bacteria to synthesize cellulose, we could feed the bacteria with deuterated glucose so that we, they were incorporating these deuterium atoms into the cellulose that they were synthesizing. Um, if you are planning on doing something like this, uh, you also have to check on how the structure of the polysaccharide uh, is being affected by the deuteration because it may be the case that it may be uh, changing. In this case, as you see, the structure of the hydrogenated and the deuterated cellulose was very similar. And uh, I'm showing you here the patterns, the, the SANS patterns from in blue, you see the hydrogenated cellulose and in red, you see the deuterated cellulose. So as you see, the shoulder feature that we were detecting in our uh, SANS patterns uh, in the hydrogenated cellulose was much more evident in the case of the deuterated cellulose and that uh, allowed us to, to test our fitting model um, with higher certainty uh, because obviously the, the feature is more evident so that we know if the, if the model is working good. Um, also important, and with this I think I will finish, is that um, as you can see, the, kind, the type of information that we get from neutrons and x-rays is completely different. Well, in the case of neutrons, we were getting information on the ribbon structure. Um, in the case of x-rays, since we were generating contrast between the crystalline and amorphous domains, we got a structural information on the cellulose microfibers. And finally, we can also perform, or it would be advisable if you have semi-crystalline carbohydrates to do some X-ray diffraction because that is also going to help you a lot, um, especially if you are doing SACS experiments. So I, I think I will finish here. Uh, you can check on the other examples later on, but uh, since we have 10 minutes for questions. I think it would be good if you ask um, anything you want. Okay, thank you very much, Marta. And I mean, it, it shows, uh, clearly shows the, the usefulness of, of uh, neutrons for studying carbohydrates. So is there anybody who want to have a questions to question to Marta? I, I can start with some questions. Yeah. Uh, first simple question, what is the difference between hydrogel and gel? No, there is no difference. Uh, I mean, uh, hydrogel is the term that is typically used uh, for carbohydrates because um, you have a large amount of water uh, in the structure, but you can use, I mean, you can use both terms. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. In the case of hydrogels, the thing is that the liquid that, that you, the liquid phase will always be water. That's okay. Yeah. And uh, you also mentioned that we can, we can by looking at the structure function, we can see the interaction um, between the samples. So if, if in the case we have two different materials and we want to see the interaction, do we need to deuterate one or we can just um, see from the intensity directly if, if these two materials are interacting with each other? So you mean if you have, a, for instance, a mixture of two components, yeah. um, well, that, would, that will depend uh, on the scattering length density of each component. Uh, if both of them have very similar scattering length densities, uh, you won't be able probably to distinguish between the structure of both of them. For instance, uh, let's, let's think of cellulose and hemicellulosis. Since they have a very similar scattering length density a value, if you do a SACS or SANS experiment, you will have an idea of the structure of the, the whole thing, you know, not the structure of cellulose and then the hemicellulose. For that, you probably uh, would have to deuterate one of the two components 
so that the scattering intensity is modified and then you have contrast between the two components. Otherwise, you will get an idea of the whole thing. And uh, the last question, you used to, uh, you use the cylinder to see the, the, the structure of the cell cellulose, um, but uh, uh, in the solution, there are many cylinders of these ones and then they interact with each other differently. Then do we need some like more specific parameters to fit this model? Because I see there is a page, but I don't really um, fully understand all the parameters that we need to fit the data. Well, um, in the case of this model uh, that we particularly used for cellulose, it is quite complex. Uh, but we, we didn't have uh, any parameter accounting for interactions between the, the fibrils because we know that in the native uh, cellulose hydrogels, um, the, the interactions between the fibrils are not so strong, meaning that the interaction between cellulose and water is more important the, than the interaction uh, between fibrils. If you dry out the material, that's another story, because in that case you eliminate water and probably you will have interactions, uh, close interactions between the fibrils. So in that case, you may need to adapt the model. But in this particular case of the hydrogels, we only have into account um, structural parameters from the dimensions of the cylinder. As you can see, the radius, mm. the thickness of the shell, uh, the length of the core and the shell, um, the volume of cellulose, uh, meaning uh, the volume fraction. So meaning how much cellulose and how much water or D2 we have. And then um, we also took into account the degree of exchange, meaning uh, how many of the labile hydroxyl groups were being exchanged when we were soaking the, the hydrogels in the different solvents. And then a power law exponent uh, to account for the, for the low Q region. So as you see, there was no interaction parameter in here, but because we know that it was not the most important thing in this case. So if I understand right, uh, in the picture, the, the circle here is the model that you use. And these little blocks like pink ones, they are, they are the cross-section view of the cellulose. Is it um, yes. So on the top part of the slide, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what you have uh, on the inner region would be the cellulose microfibrils. And you see, it's a little bit complex, okay? Because the cellulose structure is hierarchical, as I said, so that we have different levels of structure. So the smallest uh, structural feature would be the cellulose uh, microfibrils. And that's what you have inside the, the, the black circle and they contain crystalline domains which are the dotted parts and then uh, paracrystalline regions which are in blue in light blue and they are interacting with each other but this is not what we see or this is not the structural feature that is being probed in SANS. what is being probed in SANS is the the larger structural feature which would be the ribbons, meaning the combination of all this uh, microfibril into, into one larger cylinder, if you like. Of course, it's a model, uh, right? So it's not a, a cylinder as, as such, but we can consider it to be like that. And in this larger cylinder, what you have is an inner region where there is not so much um, hydrogen exchange. Why? Because the microfibrils are interacting with each other so that we don't have so many labile hydroxyl groups. Whereas in the outer region, uh, we have the labile hydroxyl groups uh, from the outer part of the microfibrils and they are easily exchanged. 
So that's why we have regions with different scattering length densities. And that's why the, the, the simple um, cylinder model didn't work in this case, because you have to take into account that the change is not going to be the same um, in the inner and the outer region. So the beneficial of using this one instead of X-ray scattering is because we can use different contrast and then we can fix them like to convince us better that this is the structure of the this hydrogen. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. So 